any questions, anything to share. Some people have brought pictures today. We've got a box full of pictures at the back. I haven't put them out until uh, we've got room here. But then uh, we do want you to uh, help us identify the, some of the people who are on them. Glad to see you back. Mel. Yeah. Mel. Yes. <laughs> Had a bad time with your leg. Yeah. And uh, yes, is it better? A lot better, or, or better, lot better now, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice to see you anyway. <coughs> right, Mister. Right, thank you, Mister Hughes. Tonight's talk, Philip Jones Griffiths, his early days. What's been documented quite substantially in his life after the age of seventeen. What I'm going to show you today is what happened up to the age of sixteen and his relationship with my family, my brother in the corner Sean, his family as well, our family. Dewey, I'm going to ask you to speak up, because okay. I know there are some oldies who can't okay. hear. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> the early years. Do you want the lights down? Oh, yes. Yes. Need the lights. <coughs> Over the piano. Behind the poster. Or oh, some more Jenny. And... Under there, yeah. Jenny? <laughs> Jenny, there's room down here. Not a light on, though. Uh, that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah. There's a chair down here. Um, there's two chairs. No, Amy. No, Amy. They all know. There's a chair on the stool. I'll have to stand here and press the next one. That's okay. I'll move the back. Thank you. Do you want a chair, Debbie? I think if I sat down, if anybody can see that. Can you go hold one? Yeah. Now you can have this one. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? Good, okay. But the story started in, 19, in the early 1930s when my mother's father worked on the railway at Thangevny and he worked with Philip's father in Thangevny and they both got transferred to Rill railway station. So Philip was born on the 18th of February 1936. Father Joseph worked on the railway with my tide. <coughs> Mother Catherine, maiden name Jones, moved to Fridland from Thangevny and lodged with my mother's family for a few months before she married Joseph. But after six months, my mother's brother Alwyn got the chicken pox. So Catherine had to move out of my mother's house to my father's parents' house. So both my mother and my father had <coughs> friendly relations with Philip Jones Griffiths' parents. And this is the house in Hylas Lake where <coughs> Philip and his family lived. And those of you with eagle eyes will note that the house was called Monva. <coughs> so Morn in Welsh is Anglesey. So Anglesey Place or Anglesey Residence, because that's where the Griffiths family came from. And at the top you'll see my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Williams, <coughs> who was at one time the district nurse and midwife in Fridland. And because Philip's mother was a midwife, <coughs> she had obviously professional working relationships and friendships with my great-grandmother, and also my father's sister Doris here, who was um, a nurse. <laughs> and those of you who were in school at that particular time, she was the knit nurse. <laughs> <laughs> For some of you in the village remember this. 
and I told my mother several times that my father's sister was, in fact, the nurse at the school. <laughs> now, my childhood memories was going to Griff's sweet shop here, which was in the front room. To the, to the um, left of the front door is a separate entrance. And I remember power sliding my bike into the driveway. But I, I got the calculation where I went smack into the gatepost. <laughs> so every time I drive past or walk past, I, I see this accident in slow motion. <laughs> Now, those of you who were at school with Philip in the village will maybe remember this episode when American soldiers came to the school in a jeep. And they came into the, into the schoolyard, high speed, American GIs came out, and as you can see from Philip's quotation, one was a man of colour. And because his mother had the sweet shop, he knew the price of Mars bars. And every child in the school had a Mars bar from the American soldiers and his comment here saying he couldn't understand why they were being given away free of charge because he knew they were an expensive purchase. Now that the bottom text on the left hand poster how do I get rid of this? Um, that. Oh. Going to remind Where's that? In that little box it says remind 10 minutes. Who's no, that? So it says 10 minutes in that box. Yeah. 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 Click on that arrow. Yeah. Click down. Tap, just tap the board on it. Oh, it's Bring it four hours. Four hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't, I won't be here then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Philip knew the cost of a mouse bar. <clears throat> and the bottom left text on, the, on that poster says, Zoning now restricts Mars bars to southern counties only, oh. but victory will mean plenty of Mars bars for everyone, everywhere, obviously after the war. <laughs> so it was a special treat. I never saw one. Now then, yeah. Now this is um, a photograph that my grandfather. My grandfather was a photographer in the village. And he took this picture of the Tabernacle Chapel Sunday School. And one thing is a bit odd, it wasn't taken at Tabernacle Sunday School, it was, it, it was taken at the back of my grandfather's house. And where Philip stands is now where my mother keeps a fridge. <laughs> now the, the gentleman who, who was in charge of the um, Sunday School was Willa Gore. Mr. Humphreys, and um, I was th I was talking to Ray Pierce in the village this afternoon, and he was telling me about Willa Gore, who had a, a different, uh, different, 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 different man. Different man, was it? Different man, was it? Yeah. it was Ted Humphreys, the blacksmith. Ah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so there we go. Tabernacle. So early influences. Now, does anybody know where, where this is? Yes. Yeah. Where your mother lives now. Right, yeah. So, that's where my grandparents live. And you can see from the front of the building, one afternoon a week, on a Tuesday, it was Barclays Bank. The front room was Barclays Bank. So, my grandmother, Jane, lived next door, lived in that house on the left. Her sister, Annie, lived on the right. And the front room was the doctor's surgery one afternoon a week. What day was this? I think it was, must have been in the, the house that was built in 1936. So it, it was between 1936 and, and the war. So late 30s, early 40s. So that summer when I was doing some work outside the house, I can see holes in the mortar where, where the bolts were. were. Okay, so the front room doubled up as a photographic studio, and at the back of the house, that's that's the view today. Okay, now you'll see down the side. That's where my grandfather had a display cabinet, 
Does anybody remember the display cabinet? Yeah. yeah. And they used to print out the photographs ready for people to order on the way to the fish and chip shop <laughs> next next door but what on, on a Friday. So he, he would, with Philip Jones Griffiths' help, <coughs> process and print out a lot of these images. Because Philip was a, a young schoolboy during this period. Okay. Now this is at the back of the house. John Richard Hughes was my grandfather. Jane Hughes is my grandmother. And the, the building there is... is was the dark room, it was the utility room. It's now my mother's kitchen. Now on the <coughs> right you'll see you'll see my grandfather wearing his photographic um, waistcoat because he kept all his film and lens, lens caps and all his photographic gear. And when you see F Philip Jones Griffiths's um, wartime photographs, he has the same um, dress sense, if you like. Now on the right, my grandmother wearing her, her darkroom overalls and gear. <coughs> so maybe when you're in the darkroom on, on Monday, you can, you can dress the same. <laughs> I'll think about it. There you go. <laughs> <coughs> Not sure about the hat. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got uh, the, the darkroom bucket ready to swill out all the all the chemicals. So this is yeah. So, so these would you believe were black and white photographs. My grandfather had a skill of tinting coloured pictures. He would sell photographs black and white for one cost, sepia toned images for another cost, and he'd colour it black and white for another, another cost. The cheaper colour ones were with, with dye, photographic dye, but the more expensive ones were with pastel. And I brought some examples on the table over there for you to see some examples of, of the pastels. <coughs> when Philip Jones Griffiths was as a schoolboy in St. Asif, he would come off the school bus opposite my grandparents' house, and because they were family friends, he would help my grandfather in the dark room. So he would help my grandfather take photographs and develop pictures. But my grandmother kept saying, Oh, Philip, are you here again? <laughs> it was usually when she was about to make tea. <laughs> <laughs> now, many of you who have photographs from this period will have a stamp on the back and if it's on a photographic mount it would have this die stamp which is shown on the left. So J. R. Hughes, Brondeg Studio, Cridlan. So what Philip used to do, he would have the boring job, because he was still a schoolboy, to stamp the back of all the photographs, use the die stamp to push through the card and on the bottom we have, because it was all glass negatives, they didn't use plastic at that time. So on the top of this box, I think I might have it over there on the table, it, it says Queen Nelly, Rose Queen. Now I've, I've waited all my life to find who Nelly Rose Queen is. Nelly Curry. Ne Thank you. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> So like a lifetime of searching ended now, thank you. Hands up those who knew Nelly Curry. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There we are. I can She's moved away from the area now, down south. So right, good. Yeah. <laughs> I can worry about something else now. Yeah. Okay. The reason why I'm showing you these pictures is this is what's leading up to the friendship between Philip Jones Griffiths and my family. Gentleman on the right, Thomas Williams, my great-grandfather, and he was a dairy farmer, and this white farmhouse here is called Tinoli Rodin, or some, some records call it Odin House. Okay. 
and that building on the right is where the scout hut is now I believe. My, my father re remembered when he was a small child one winter the roof blowing off into my great grandfather's orchard. Right so my great grandfather on the right Thomas Williams, the ladies by the wall by the building, great grandmother Elizabeth Williams, district nurse, mid midwife, my grandmother Jane, her sister Annie, and this gentleman, this young boy I should say, on the left, his name was uh, Noel Cecil Sarson. Now if you look on the war memorial of the soldiers yeah. killed in action in the first war, that was him. Yes. Okay, Noel Cecil Sarson. Now my grandmother had three daughters and the plan was one of the daughters to take over the farm but n none of them wanted the farm so the, the, the foster son Noel Cecil Sarson his natural father was a doctor he was Canadian and he was based at Kimmel Camp his natural mother lived in Church Street but something happened around about 1914 I think his natural mother died so my great grandfather fostered him then as the next pictures show now, several people in the village say that young boy is either somebody called Morris or Anne Will but I think it's um, Noel Cecil Sarson because on the desk over there I've got all his call-up papers of World War I and because his father was a Canadian he served in the Canadian regiment so Noel Cecil Sarson on the left that's my grand great grandfather with his Thomas Williams tin oil rod in dairy now he was killed in action 1917 and if you see on the right hand side, that's his name on the on the war memorial. So Noel Cecil Sarson, who's yeah. half Canadian. Do you know where he's buried, Devon? Yes. What I've, there's, an interest, there's an interesting internet project called War Graves. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so if you look on my desk over there afterwards, I've got all the details. That's his temporary um, cross. grave grave cross, if you like. And it's taken me most of my life to find his proper burial. I went onto a um, Canadian soldier's website and I typed in his name and all his call-up papers signed in the castle came up. Pictures of um, where he's buried, the plot, everything. So if you look at my desk over there afterwards you'll see all my detective work. <laughs> So if you walk past the war memorial and looked at the first World War names, you think, well, who's he then? Yeah. That's who he was. Yeah. Okay. So my grandmother and her sisters always spoke about Noel Sarson. So the own boy, Philip Jones Griffiths, would have grown up visiting the house, known all about this First World War tragedy. Okay. So my, my, this is a picture of my father, aged nine, first Ridland Cub Scouts, 1929. So my great, so my grandfather took lots of photographs in the village of village life. And when Philip Jones Griffiths was a small boy, schoolboy, he would accompany my grandfather, take some photographs, and he would also develop and print pictures. So this this was a a, a family. Um, See your mother and father there. Yes. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I show on here. Glenn, this is the one we wrote Yeah. <laughs> My mother's written on the back of the, the original picture the names of everybody. Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, my mother and father, not long after they got married. Okay. Elwyn Roberts. Yeah, my is mine? Elwyn is, Elwyn is my was my father's first cousin. And Annie, his wife, my grandmother Jane, her sister Annie, her older sister Lizzie, 
married, married to, to WJ. WJ. Yeah. That's it. John. That's it. That's my cousin Michael. Oh, Michael yeah. Because at that point, his mother just died, age yeah. 31. Yeah. Oh. That's why she's not in the picture. Yeah. So my grandfather took the photograph from opposite. Yeah. Because there was hardly any traffic, he could set up his camera and click on exposure. There's Bryn just across the road. And there's um, my cousin, my dad's cousin, Vanwy and Bob. Is Owen Roberts there? Yeah. Mr. Roberts, the minister. Yeah. Owen Jones. Yeah. Owen Roberts. I showed this picture to my next door neighbour, and Alad next door was. Oh, Very impressed that the minister was on. And your uncle at the back? Mr. Lewis. Which one? Yep, that's your mother's brother, isn't it? It's a chapel. No, this one here. That, that's um, Michael's father. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, Gordon Shepherd. Oh, who's the gentleman on the right? Yeah. Yeah. Jones. Uh, he, he, uh, Mr. Roberts, Mona Villa. Mona Villa. Mona Villa. Roberts. Yeah. Mona Villa. Yeah. The Welling Roberts. That's right. The Welling Roberts. Yeah. Yes. So, this is, you get a feel now, in a sense, that this is what my grandfather took. It, it was recording the, the village life. Margaret Roberts as well. Yeah, so Philip, the old schoolboy Philip would have helped him record this photographically and also develop and process and stamp the, the photographs. Where was Cluid Cathy? It's where the rental shop is now for property. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you look on the pavement, I'm not sure if it's still got the double step. I'm not sure. Yes, it has the fence there. So that was the centre of, of the high life in the village, the celebration. Cluey Cafe. Do you have the year for the I got some, sorry? What year? Um, it, it, um, it would have been 1949. 1948, 1949, that was it. Okay. Uh, thankfully, that's not me, that's my older brother Kelvin. Yeah. Because my, my grandfather died before I was born. So when, when Kelvin was young, he was a toddler. Yeah. He had lots of pictures taken, yeah. and so, um, we're fortunate not enough to not have a photograph of you then. No, but I had hand me down jumpers and shoes. But these were um, black and white photographs, so the young Philip would have had a knowledge of colouring up pictures. But Philip Jones Griffiths's work was entirely black and white, except for his latest, his last few years, which were in colour. So Philip Jones Griffiths would have learnt the art of composition, how to frame a photograph, how to put people at ease when you take a photograph from these early days. Right, so um, because we're not linked to the internet, what I'm going to do is at the end of this talk, I'm going to show you a movie on my laptop, those of you who want to see. Oh, couldn't you? Do it, yeah? No, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no link. <coughs> Can you see it? Yeah. 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 And all these pictures were taken with a <coughs> camera hook with glass negatives. Now you notice the circle, white circle, that was with an old penny. So everything was contact printed from a glass negative, no enlargers, glass contact print. Penny exposed the picture and Philip would have helped my grandfather all these pictures on the Friday night when people were going to the chip shop. <laughs> so they'd knock on the door and ask my grandmother, can we order five pictures of number five please? Thank you very much. <laughs> now what, another thing I want to ask for the audience is, do we know who the, the child is on the left? That's, 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 another, that's another mystery. It looks like David Morris. Yeah. It looks like Elvin Morris. Yeah. Right. It looks like David. I think it's one of the Morrises, but yeah. I don't know which one. Yeah. I 
I think it's David. What year was that? 1948, 1949. Right. Yeah. 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 To see pictures like this, we're from professional photographers, and they buy the prints. It's not like today when anybody can go to the castle and take a picture. This was quite a, a rare event. What year was this? 48, 49. Yeah. What's that, lady? That would be Tudor, lady. I thought it was Tudor. Yeah. Who's the next one? Mrs. Forder. Yeah, it could be Florence Forder, couldn't it? Is Playing it? the piano. Could be, yes. Yeah, most likely. Because when I when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, was this Florence Forder? Mrs. Forder. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Forder. Yeah, because I went for piano lessons with Mrs. Forder. Yeah. 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 By the time I went for piano lessons, there was no ivory on the keyboards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this celebrating? No, what would it be celebrating? Forty. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the glass negative box where all these were kept are gone, so I've got no, no way of knowing what the celebration was. It'll be the first rose clean after the war, would it? When were you in the Morris Oh, God, I don't know. Last week on it, <laughs> About 14, 13, 14. Okay, what, what I've got here are photographs not of my grandfather, of my father, Thomas Hughes. When he went to the Second World War, he was given a camera by my grandfather and quite a few rolls of film. And his wartime journey, if you like, from 1939 to 45 was documented. And I brought this album, which is on the desk, for you to have a look at afterwards. And the young Philip would have seen all this because when the war was finished, he was what he was born in 1936. He'd have been nine when the war finished. So from the age of nine up until when my grandfather died, Philip was 17. So from the age of nine to 17, he would have seen these pictures. He would have obviously absorbed this information because when I showed this lecture to some students at Clandridge College a couple of years ago, one of my students said, this is the same style as Philip. Mm. It's not recording the actual warfare, it's recording mm. what's, going, what's on. going on around. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And each photograph you'll see in the album is captioned my Auntie Doris captioned every photograph. Obviously it must have been after the war. So I don't know whether the pictures were sent home throughout the war or whether they were brought home after the war and everything was cap captioned afterwards. I don't know. So you'll see a common theme whereby my grandfather's <coughs> photography and expertise, my father's wartime photographs, have somehow focused, focused the mind of the, the schoolboy, Philip Jones Griffiths. Okay. Again, my father, a black and white picture turned into colour. Okay. Now you'll see on the bottom is the, is the die stamp with the Ron Daig studio. And photographers in that time also signed their photographs. So that just below the photograph there's J.R. Hughes Ridland where he actually signed it with a day stamp, yeah. date stamp as well. Okay. Right, there's, there's an iMovie, but what I'm going to do is play it afterwards. Or oh, do you want to see it on the small screen over there now? What can we do? Okay, we'll see afterwards. Okay. okay. <coughs> What I've got on the main screen there is all those photographs in the album as a slideshow. So you can see them quite big. And if you go on the Fridland Town Council website and click on the history page, you'll see some of these movies 
in action. Okay. What's it under on the If you go to the, the, the Town Council the website, Town Council website, under history, okay. then on the right hand side there's a list and it'll say World War II photograph. Right. Okay. Are they all posted on YouTube? Yeah, but, but, but if you typed in on YouTube and did a search, you won't find them. Right. You have to go on a specific website to see them. Oh, here right then. St. Joseph Grammar School, 1948, age 12. It's Frank on the back. So where are you, Frank? Right in the centre. The black hair. And Dewey and Dudley there. Who's Derry? Derry Lloyd Roberts. Derry Roberts. Dudley Edwards. Frank Jones. So where are you, Frank? Who's pointing me? In the middle. There. 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 There's Dewey Lloyd Roberts, there's Dudley Edwards. Oh. Um, Clive Jones, son of Elliot Jones, schoolmaster from Rill. Oh. Oh, okay. um, the lad on the far left on the bottom, is that Richard Jones? That's Richard Jones from Vale Road, yes. Yes, oh. He's Leslie Carr, oh. Kemmer oh. Fallman. Oh. That's the one on the end. Front row. Left. This one. Left. No, that's Dudley. Uh, Richard Jones from Vale Road. Road. Yeah. Um, Dudley was his father was the butcher in yeah. Castle Street. Yeah. Uh, Dewey's father was on a photograph we've seen before. He was a butcher. Well. Well. Mm -hmm. We were all in form three or four in St. Asaph Grammar School then. Very good. So that was, um, um, that, was my first year, that was Frank and Philip, age 12. Mind you, Clyde Jones was yeah, as well. Philip, Philip, Philip's four or five years younger than me. <coughs> right, this is um, another picture, and there's another member of the audience picture. Isn't there? <laughs> Need a there you go. So, can you see where Reg is? Reg, do you know where Reg is on the picture? Reg, 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 yeah. Okay, so that's um, Adrian. Right. Adrian Henry. Adrian Henry. His family were oh, moved here during yeah. the war. Back in yeah. the were they? They're from Very Liverpool. Clever family, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, then he had his schooling in St. Asa Grammar School. Yeah. He, was, he was four years older than Philip, but they always used to mimic each other. Yeah. Okay. Adrian so Henry became yeah. famous years, Yes. Now, about yeah. ten years ago, we did a, a poster and a programme and an invitation card for yes, he did. Adrian Henry. Yes, he did. Yeah. And he, when he, when we sent the proofs off, he was he was telling us all about his um, school days with um, Philip. Sorry. Didn't mention Reg, but he mentioned Philip. <laughs> <laughs> so Reg was a good boy. <laughs> Okay, so they both had the same same way of thinking, same same outlook. Well, he was a poet, wasn't he? Yes. So what happens is after after school and after college, you'll see in a second their friendship grew even more with the Liverpool scene, if you like. Now, school tennis team. Now, my next door neighbour, but one is on the top row. Um, there's Adelis Cunner there. Yeah. Oh, oh, the old Thelma Brown. So oh, yes. Ken Hughes. Ken Hughes, the tennis player. <laughs> Lenny Wright there. Is it? Oh, yes. On the left. Adelis um, Cunner on the front row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So <coughs> that, those of you who know Ken Hughes, he, he's Ken Hughes. the top. Second to the right. Yeah. What was his name? McDonald. The Crescent. From the Crescent. Okay. His name is there. I can't remember his name. Second from the right. Who's that? I can't remember. Eric. Was it Eric? Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> Philip. Philip's father. My grandfather, Rich, John Richard. My grandfather, Owen. John Owen. And. Owen D. Timothy, the chemist, were all, all friends, they were four friends. And the relationship between the four friends had a bearing on Philip's um, eventual career. They decided that photography and being a pharmacist went hand in hand, because in those days if you wanted a picture process you'd have to go to a chemist or a professional photographer. So we got himself a job at Boots, the chemist in Rill, on a Saturday. Yeah. So I think where Will was, was there is now a shoe shop. There's a building on the left, this side, it is a cafe, but it used to be the cinema. There must have been a May Day or something. Yeah. All the bunting. Yeah. So Philip had a, had a Saturday job in Boots, the chemist in Rill. Then he went on to study pharmacy in Liverpool, but, be, but what he did before then, as a summer job, he also worked at Golden Sands Holiday Camp as a um, holiday camp photographer. And this is where he learned the skill of approaching total strangers, please kind of take your photograph. There's a special art in it, getting people to drop the guard and <coughs> allow you to take photographs. And at this point of time, it, it was the first time he took photographs for money. Obviously, the more pictures he took, the more pictures that were sold, the more he earned as the holiday job. So he, his grounding in approaching people stems from this period. Now, if you Google Philip Jones Griffiths, this, this quotation is quite often one that comes up. The only thing we photographers really want, more than life, more than rumpy pumpy, more than anything else, is to be invisible. Okay. Yeah. Now Ken was telling me, my next door neighbour, but one, but he kept saying that Philip was always trying to be invisible in school. I don't know if anybody else in the school has that recollection. So when I showed this this slide to a group of students at College Llandrillo last year. One student said, he's got the same style of wearing shabby shirts and iron. <laughs> so, the rumpled look. <laughs> but, unbelievably, there is a quotation by Philip on the internet saying it's a look that he liked. Because he couldn't be bothered ironing shirts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear that, William? <laughs> <laughs> so after, after, after college, after school, because Philip went to school, went to college in Liverpool to study pharmacy, and in the evenings, the weekends, they would go to where all the teenagers would hang out, namely places like the Cavern Club. Now, a lot lot of his 1960s photographs were of the Beatles in the Kevin Club and as you'll see further on. Have you got any of those? The, the originals? Yes. No. <laughs> the only pictures we've got of Philip Jones Griffiths are out of my grandparents. No, the Beatles I meant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, oh, Philip's pictures inside the Cavern Club in its heyday, 1963. So all these pictures are in his book called Recollections. That was part of the exhibition. Exhibition, <coughs> yeah. Now, who here has been to the Cavern Club? Mm -hmm. You have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
1963 or? I was there in 1963, yeah, 64, yes. So Roger McGough, Adrian Henry and all these Liverpool Merseyside artists were all his friends, all his contemporaries. So a lot of the imagery regarding the early 1960s and the Cavern Club and all that <coughs> partly down to Philip's photographs. Mm -hmm. Now Adrian Henry in one of his most famous exhibitions, now over his shoulder you'll see there's a photographer in the painting. Mm. I've always wondered is that really a picture of Philip? Could be, because they were very good friends. But he always called himself, Adrian Henry, a Liverpool poet. Even though he, he had schools around here, he was always called a Liverpool poet. Now when, when you read about Philip Jones Griffiths' story, it always starts at the age of 16. There's nothing before that in, in his biographies. Um, as at, at the age of 16 is when my grandfather died. So after age 16, his direction went in a different way because his mentor, if you like, was no longer there. So he looked and had other influences. And one of his influences was a photographer called Embrys Jones. And this is the photograph Embrys Jones projected onto the Real Camera Club's screen. I said, what do you think of this, folks? And if you look at it in more detail, it's upside down. That's the real way round. Because what he wanted to do, Emrys Jones, was to tell the photographer, if a composition works upside down, then it's a good photograph, because it, it, it's pleasing to the eye. Now one of Philip's heroes was Henri Cartier-Bresson. I don't know if you've ever come across his work. Okay. A lot of wartime photography. So there's a theme already going through Phillips' work. It's, it's warfare. Philip actually said about that photograph, it's the greatest documentary picture ever taken. This one? Yeah. 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 Because he said <coughs> when it was taken pre-war, um, I think the, the poster in the background, yeah. which I think is, is he a, um, it was a, a Jewish um, kind of circus act, and the broken wheel representing obviously what it represents, and the leap into wartime, yeah, and everything in the photo. That's it, yeah. yeah. So there's this quote here, not since Goya, famous painter, has anywhere, anyone portrayed war like Philip Jones Griffiths? So at, at, at an early age, he decided his thing was, was war, or the, the recording of. And his hero had a specific type of camera, a, a point, and, point and shoot camera, a Leica. That's what Tom, Tom's got. I use it. I use it. Yeah. <coughs> so, one of the things about being a photographer is to learn and appreciate the work of others. So he'd study Cartier-Bresson's work, so he'd have an idea of what to look for when he was in these that type of <coughs> situations. Now, the picture on the left is of people outside Pentonville Court and Prison. And if you look on the, the right, never underestimate the power of boredom. Because he was bored to tears being a pharmacist. So what he did, he got a daytime job as a photographer with a newspaper as well. So these pictures on the left show his freelance work at the same time as when he was working in the pharmacy. Now the picture on the left is one of the very first film cameras. So my grandfather had a, an Agiflex camera like that. So towards the end of his life he was using glass negatives and also plastic film which was just newly available. Now the quotation on the right hand side composed the photograph in the camera viewfinder. The reason being because the photographs were taken on glass negative. What you photographed was what was printed, because it was a contact sheet. 
you couldn't actually crop past the photograph. So Philip got into a routine of composing everything in the viewfinder of the camera. So what he photographed was what was printed. There was no cropping or, or what, what, what people call these days, no photoshopping. How, how would you, how would they be able to get that but, uh, in the right place if it was... Well, the composition? Be, yeah. By having the, the following, photographer's eye. Yeah, following that little girl until she was in the right place. Yes, yeah, it's just a matter of experience mm -hmm. and being able to appreciate composition. Mm. That only comes with experience and practice. So once the, when I met Philip, the last, the, it turns out the last time, it was at the Steadbod in Denby when he had the big exhibition. And he, he told me he'd been to see my mother and father, but nobody was in. But my father had just popped the shop to buy some milk, and my mother was in the garden doing some gardening. Philip turned up half an hour before he should have, thought nobody was in, and went to the Steadbod when he saw me. And I was asking him about this quotation here. He says, <coughs> the why, when you take photographs, it's, it's the why when you're a photo journalist. <coughs> so his first editor said, who, what, why, where, when. And you'll see this in the middle. It's the one that counts as the middle one. To me, our task is to ask why. So when he went to Vietnam, his quest was to ask the question, why is this going on? Right, um, we're not linked to the internet, so I'll skip this, this bit. Now, most people think the Vietnam War was only 10 years long, but the 10 years was only the American involvement. It actually went on for about 20 years, and before that, the Vietnam were fighting the French. So it was a lot longer conflict than most people think. So what we're going to look at now are quite a few films, books and magazines which featured um, Philip, the, by now, the <coughs> experienced war photographer. So <coughs> this is the book published in 1971, Vietnam Incorporated. Now, as you'll see in the next coming slides, this galvanised public opinion, in America especially, to stop the war. <coughs> now as you can see, there's, there's not a lot of um, war, actual physical warfare going on. It's, it's work effect and it's things going around the warfare. Very soon it's my father's pictures now you'll notice the top right hand picture of the pig, we'll come to that afterwards. Again, it's, it's every, everyday life with war things in the, in, the, in the background. So the good thing about Philip Jones Griffiths' work is the composition. That all his photographs are memorable because he's composed the pictures to tell a story. And that's Philip, 1971. Noticed <coughs> several cameras around his neck. He always had, when he was working, three or four cameras around his neck. And the 1979 Hollywood film Apocalypse Now mainly was based on his photography. Yeah. Now, the bottom left picture is of this um, Viet Cong soldier. And Francis Ford Coppola, the guy in the, in the centre with, with the camera, he actually wrote the script around that photograph. There's a scene in the film where there's a soldier, a Vietnam soldier, is very badly injured. And it's based on, on Philip's recollection of what happened when that photograph was taken. But during the, during the film, the top <coughs> right hand picture shows Dennis Hopper <coughs> as a photographer. 
but it was the opposite of Philip. It wasn't somebody trying to be invisible. This this chap, but, um, Dennis Hopper was characterising, character, characterising, was um, quite an egomaniac, totally unlike Philip. So if you ever see this film on television, have a, another look at it. And a lot of the pictures, a lot of the planning for this film was based on Philip's photography. Did you ever hear the story that Philip spoke to the director of the film? No, to, to, to Francis Ford. What did he say? <laughs> yeah, I suppose he says, I suppose he says, you've copied some of my images. He says, sue me. Yeah. <laughs> Put the phone there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Philip just laughed. He says it was typical <laughs> Hollywood. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> sue me. Okay. I actually remember these magazine pictures mm. in 1972. Now, it wasn't until recently I saw, I've seen a, a high resolution blower <laughs> of, of this picture. And I always thought it was a man, but it's a woman. Yeah. So this helped to galvanise public opinion in Britain. Now if you go on, on the, the, the Town Council website you'll see in the history I'll put up a link where you can see the, the actual video, which I was going to show. I'll put the link so you can see it in more detail. I've actually brought all these books with me if anybody else to look at. There we go. Excellent. Now, this, this, this famous picture on the left shows a schoolboy aged 10. And he was called Tiger. He was the uh, <coughs> child, child soldier. So it was shocking images like this, on the bottom left, you can't see it here, but in detail, is primary school classroom mourning one of their um, classmates. Now in, in the United States, I believe Philip was, was, was banned from entering the country in the, in the 60s and 70s because of, because of his opposition to the war. And you'll see that demonstrations were very large and in Kent State University four students got, got killed by the um, National Guard. So Philip's book <coughs> was read and discussed in the White House as well because that book was influential in, in galvanising public opinion against the war. Now you see on the left, bottom left, that's the, the Vietnam War Memorial in the United States for the, for, for the American soldiers dead. If all the names of the Vietnamese people, the, you know, the citizens, was on the same word density as what's on the United States Soldiers Memorial, it would be nine miles long. Because that goes quite a long way, yeah. doesn't it? So, that, so the US soldiers was, is forget how many metres it is, but the, 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 the equivalent to the population of Vietnam who were killed would be equal to nine miles long. So top left, um, Lyndon Johnson, then Nixon, bottom right, Gerald Ford actually stopped the war. And he's there in the centre with Nelson Rockefeller and um, Kissinger. Yeah. There was a documentary on television last night about Kissinger. Did anyone see it? <clears throat> now these are Philip's later books. And when, when I was doing the research for this, I went to the library and asked for the books and they didn't have any, which I was astounded by. They had to order the books in specially. So the book on the left is all about his pictures in Northern Ireland during the troubles in the early 70s. Okay. Great Journeys, that's a quite a nice book. It, it, it shows you his visit to Vietnam quite a few years after the war had finished. The central book, Agent Orange, is quite a upsetting book to view. But it's all about what happened to the citizens of Vietnam when they were sprayed with this Agent Orange. Okay. It, it, 
It's a difficult book to read. Second from the right, Vietnam at Peace, where he went back again, 2004, 2005, to photograph how Vietnam had changed since his days of taking war pictures. On the right, recollections, mainly of pictures of South Wales. But one thing that strikes me about Philip's work, I've never seen a picture of Rutherland. No. Too peaceful. Yeah. <coughs> so this is um, his 1989 Great Journeys where he'd visited Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam. And just caught. This time in colour, because all his mm. previous pictures were in black and white. So exhibition and education. Excuse me, are those still available in prints? Th those books, print, yeah, yeah. No, because I asked two questions, sorry. But because because still available. Yeah. Um, if I go back a step. Right. This this Vietnam ink was reprinted in two thousand and six. So if you go to the library and ask for the book, they'll it's in the county somewhere at the, at the headquarters, but you, and it takes a week or so for it to arrive. So these books are also in the county, but you'd have to order them specially. <coughs> so this was the exhibition at the library um, last oh, April two, 2010. So you'll see <coughs> the Beatles pictures on the top, then the pictures of the Cavern Club, and on the right hand side we've got <coughs> the pictures of South Wales. And throughout that period of, of the exhibition, lots of students came to do research for their projects. Okay. <coughs> These are some of my A-level students. So you know this macro, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> so <coughs> what I tend to do is, every student I get, I'm making them aware of Philip Jones Griffiths' work. Because um, about four or five years ago, I had a Vietnamese student, and she knew all about Philip Jones Griffiths, but all the students from Rhythm to Stavon hadn't got a clue who he was. <coughs> yeah. So what I also do is, we look at pictures, sometimes I might use Philip's pictures to have a look at, or what I tend to do is show the students how to retouch all photographs in what's called Photoshop. I iron out the creases, iron out missing bits. So when I talk to the students about photography, I talk about Philip Jones Griffiths' work, and I'll also show them how to rebuild any old photographs. So we, I can scan some old, old negatives and turn them into positives. <coughs> So these are my my favourite photographs that Philip took. That's my favourite picture. And there's a story behind this because during the war my father and his cousins had a part shared in a pig. <laughs> and the pig lived in a sty behind what was Eddie Bright's butcher's shop where, where the toy, toy shop is now. At the back there there's a sty. So I, I I often thought when Philip took this photograph, was he because he must have been a small boy and he must have seen this pig. I was just wondering in my mind's eye, did, was he smiling when he took this picture, thinking, "Ah, a pig." So this picture here on the left is um, quite current, really, if you think about world world events. So the picture on the right, I think, is is, is a striking image. Yeah. When you see a high resolution version of that, you'll see all the detail on the label. It makes more sense. It's more scary seeing the, the actual detail on the label. Then he died, 19th of March 2008, age 72. So afterwards, if you'd like to have a look at 
some of my pictures, negatives, more than welcome to do so. So, there's thank yous. That's, that's right. it. I'm just going to start with that. <coughs> Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Yeah. So you didn't expect to see yourself on this. No. <laughs> <laughs>